it is crucial that you care about something else outside yourself. Anybody who's got family around them, they've got something else outside them. So that that is something else. But caring about something else outside yourself day to day certainly gives you a focus. And I think something more tangible to come out of being locked up all this time. Hello and welcome back to Breakfast of Boots. I'm your host, Becca Boots, and today is the sixth part of my 10 part series where I bring on wonderful people from my network so that they can share their nuggets of gold with us. Now, today is a very exciting day because I have the lovely Mel Cunningham with me. Now, me and Mel met a few years back through Toastmasters, and we've just been coming in and out of each other's lives ever since. We've been training in mental health first aid together. We, everything we do seems to mean that we align into each other's worlds. And so I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. So let me bring her on. I hope you enjoy it. Please welcome Mel. Hi Mel, thank you so much for joining me today. It's so exciting to have you on. Um, a little warning for viewers, me and Mel are a little bit hyperactive together. So um, <laughs> if I want to turn the volume down. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. For our audience, for those who don't know you, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? Thanks, Becca, for having me this morning. Uh, yeah, just as a warning, we do get a little bit hyperactive and bounce off each other a lot. We are likely to go off on a tangent. So I'm Mel. I'm a photographer. My business is called Vivacious Mel Photography. And I started about seven years ago. And what I've realized in that time is that I'm not a normal photographer. And that kind of is what we're going to talk about today. Hold around a whole bunch of other things. When I first started, all the other people that I started with are no longer in business. And I think one of the reasons is that most people focused on the photography, whereas I have focused on the people. And for me, it's always been about helping the people, whoever I'm photographing, enjoy being photographed and see themselves differently. And I don't know why I did that. That's just how I always did it, because I always saw something different in people from, I think, what other photographers saw. And I think a lot of people go into photography thinking it's going to be uh, incredibly lucrative. Let me tell you, it's not, <laughs> but it can be if you do something that you're really passionate about. And I think that's the difference. So I know that I've definitely lasted this long because I've not just been about photography. I want to dive into that a little bit more. So okay. you alluded that with your brand and everything you do, you do have a really different angle to it. And a lot of what you do is about transformation and helping people to kind of get past those limiting beliefs around change as well. So do you want to talk about that and what your I am, we are our change is? Yeah. So I think I'm going to start at the beginning mm -hmm. and say that when I first started doing photography as a child, I just photographed people as they were. But what I didn't realize was I was photographing them as they could be. So when I started to do I am my change, it was to do with helping people change their perception of what their potential was, but also change their future. So it had this whole idea of you would be going down one path, but if I photographed you doing something different, you would hopefully choose a different path. So you would see yourself differently. And that had more to do with exercise and being um, more fit and healthy. And actually that's become much more of a bigger thing. It's not just about that. I've moved it more into business. So anybody I photograph in a business sense, most of their businesses will focus on change mm -hmm. and getting them to see themselves differently and the impact that they're going to have and the impact that they will have is one of those things that a lot of people start off with their business thinking, I can't do it. I'm not quite sure that I'm going to have that impact. Um, 
I've got this great idea, but I'm not sure that it's really going to come off. Mm -hmm. And something happens when you see yourself differently in a photograph. And I think that's kind of what's happened. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because I remember you saying um, that's something people really liked about your photography is that no one ever has made them look that nice. Like yeah. you, 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 and that, that's why you're um, wanting to be the photographer at my wedding because you are incredible. And I said to everyone, you're incredible capturing emotion and capturing people in, because every time I see people capturing people in motion, you end up getting a bit of like just the worst part of you in motion that looks <laughs> like you've been I don't know, caught in the wind, but you manage to capture people in motion, but in a really attractive way, if that makes sense. Yeah, see, it's interesting. I think one of the, the reasons that I capture people as they are in those, in those ways and particularly in that emotional state. Um, again, this is not a, a typical photographer way of photographing. Um, so when I, I was taught music quite early on and I can listen to a piece of music, an orchestra and pick out every single piece of each instrument. I've always been able to do this. And this is how I photograph. I will go into a room and I will hear the 15, 20, 5, 30 conversations going on in the room, all individually. And I'll be listening for the pitch of someone's storytelling. And if they're in a group, you'll hear when the, the voice goes up and everybody around them will laugh. And that's how you always get such emotional pictures. Mm -hmm because i'm listening i'm not i'm not looking i'm listening to what people are saying and i think this is also the difference i photograph people as we're talking yeah and so it's only when i know that you're going to be telling that story or you'll show that emotion about being passionate about something or um, caring about something mm -hmm. and that's when i'll photograph not when you're yeah doing that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because that just doesn't work. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the outtakes as well. Oh, my God. <laughs> the outtakes are just hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic. That's awesome. And I think, oh, and, and, by the way, super excited to be your wedding photographer. When we're I know. Wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, you Mel. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Make yeah. it beautiful. <laughs> No, you'll be just as you are, except that I might, <laughs> I might have to get stilts or something. <laughs> Mel's, so, very, Mel's very little, but I'm very large. <laughs> <laughs> we do have this thing where uh, the long and the short of it mm -hmm. is basically how we are. Yeah. I'm a foot shorter than Becca. <laughs> At least. At least. <laughs> we'll get you a little standing frame you can stand on. I'm tempted. Seriously tempted. We'll, I'll get one of those IKEA, you know, ladders just to, and I'll get a little minion. Oh, I'll get a little minion to carry around the ladder after me. Oh, God. Can't wait. Actually, talking about a little minion. Yeah. Um, you have a little wingman, don't yeah. you? We're talking about unusual photography. Yeah. You have a wingman that you bring with you on your photo shoots. Shall I bring him in? Bring He's him in. Sleepy. Bring him in. Hang on. He's a little sleepy. Oh. I thought we were going for a walk because I got dressed up. <laughs> yeah, but he, he's your little wingman, isn't he? Where you bring him around. Hello, Kenny. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. For those who are listening, she has the most cutest little dog. It's not a minion. Right, what, what breed is he? So he's a Dachshund Jack Russell cross. Mm. Mm. So why do you bring him on your shoots with you? Other than that you love him loads. <laughs> so when I first started to do photography as a job, I had a different dog. He was a much bigger dog. And everybody commented that Indy always made them feel really relaxed. And then when I got Mackenzie, on the first, on the very first day that I took him to the photo shoot, so I think I'd had him three days, 
he went and sat perfectly posed in front of the, the lights, waited for the person to turn up and sit down, sat there like a model. And she was like, oh, this is great. I can just talk to the dog. I can just pat the dog. And she, she was so nervous about being photographed. And she just said, always take the dog. I was like, I was planning on it. Um, so I think he does his job and I do mine. And he just makes everybody feel relaxed and like the focus isn't on them because when you've got the camera in your face and it's quite a big thing, it's quite scary. If you're then being told to look straight at the camera, it's a little bit confronting. So having a wee dog to pat instead calms everybody down. If you're not a dog person, then you're probably not going to be a client, but you know, that's just how it is. Um, yeah, and he's always been incredibly well behaved in other people's houses. He's just always known that's what his job is. It's really weird. He's never destroyed anything. He's never peed on anything. He just, yeah, even when he was a puppy, he just did it. So, yeah, I think dogs, dogs for life, they, they know their job. Yeah. They like to have a job. So, yeah, it just comes. He's even been to weddings, like literally. He's just sat in the back. We, I had one girl who her dad had died fairly recently before the wedding. So it was a pretty traumatic not to have her dad there. And she said, please just, just bring him. And so she and her mum basically cuddled him the whole time they were getting ready. Um, and he just sat in the back of the church. <laughs> I mean, just ridiculous. Um, and yeah, someone came to collect him because I couldn't have him all day. Um, but yeah, I've got a couple of weddings next year and they were like, please just let him come. He can just wander around the fields. And I'm thinking, okay, need to put someone in charge of him. But yeah. Oh, lovely. I, know, I think dog, we'll have to do our little dog walks together. Be lovely. <laughs> so you mentioned when like the dog helps you keep the like relax people and everything. And I remember when, before I became a mental health first aid trainer, we trained in mental health first aid together. So we went on the course together and you said that mental health first aid was really useful in the work you did. Yeah. How does, how does it play into what you do? When I first started, I mean, one of the things for me is that I end up photographing a lot of women. 95% of the people that are photographed are women. Whether that's because I'm a female photographer, I'm not sure. And there is a point in every single shoot where they will reveal something that they haven't told anybody or they haven't spoken about for a very long time or something that's been churning over in the back of their heads. And there's something about suddenly feeling very vulnerable in front of the camera and seeing yourself you know, in the images. I genuinely can't explain it because I've not experienced it myself, but I've seen it happen every single time. I, I can tell at what point it's gonna happen. Uh, so last week, I photographed someone who, um, we were talking about different therapies and how, you know, with lockdown, people are now possibly able to go, well, I think now they can go and see chiropractors and um, reflexology people and that sort of stuff. And she then started describing how she'd gone to um, a chiropractor when she was 25. And it was the first time that someone had addressed the emotional pain rather than just the physical pain of her injury from when she was a child. And of course, what a wax. <laughs> Thank goodness at the end of the photo shoot when you know the makeup, didn't need the makeup anymore. But those kind of things, I have to be really, aware of that maybe it's triggered something or talking about things has triggered something for people and I'm quite conscious now that just checking that they've either seen someone about it or that they haven't to go and speak to someone or to recognize that it's quite an emotional thing for them so maybe they need to investigate why that is and um, but I mean that's just one example I've had people tell me they've you know, 11 miscarriages or 
had anorexia or um, being bullied when they were a child or um, have a boss that bullied them for however many years. And it's quite emotional stuff. And it can be quite draining for me. So I also have to be really aware of keeping that distance too. So doing the training was actually really helpful for me, recognizing that I can't keep taking on other people's emotions yeah. and knowing where that boundary is, but respecting the fact that I created this incredibly safe space for them to talk about stuff but knowing that I'm not the right person to be treating, yeah. resolving those things for them. I'm just a conduit, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Someone and that's else. what mental health first aiders do, don't they? They're, they're not a therapist. You don't train them to be a therapist. You train them to be that person who steps in while they wait um, professional help. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Genuinely, that's what I really needed to have confidence in doing because I was thinking, oh God, these people's stories, they're horrendous. You know, they should do something about them. But I was then taking that on board thinking, if I'm the only person they've told, then that's not good either. And recognizing that, yeah, you have to wait and hold that safe space for them so that they can be properly treated. Um, yeah and it's fascinating but and I, again I think this is why I'm still doing photography because most people they don't see the person they see the photograph mm. and I struggle with photographers like that because they talk numbers at me and they go oh you should photograph like this and this and this and that I'm like you're standing in front of the person and, and that has taken me a really long time to recognize that they're just not like that. A lot of people just don't, don't see that. Mm. They see the numbers and they see the, the lighting and, and that's important to get the right photo, but you're never going to get the right photo if you haven't connected with them as a person. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be able to empathize their emotion to be able to bring out the right emotion in the photos as well. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I love hearing about what people are passionate about or what, what really makes them light up. And I think that's the difference, particularly for someone's mental health in that if you haven't spoken about something, it's going to weigh you down. And you can see as soon as they've spoken about it, there's this light that kind of comes out from them. And that's what you see in the photos because they're no longer letting that sink them down. So yeah. yeah that course is awesome yeah oh, it's good. And, and i suppose imposter syndrome we, we've talked about that before haven't we where um when you're making this change into the world of you know your new business or as a new you mm. that imposter syndrome and you said how businesses really struggle to see themselves as a new business or whatever until they actually see themselves so and imposter syndrome, your photo photographs i suppose bring out that kind of imposter syndrome as well, but help to almost nourish it in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting observation. Um, what I realized was that so often I was working with women who were just starting out and so many of them would say, I don't feel confident in what I'm doing, but I've been through this really traumatic experience. So I don't want anybody else to experience what I've been through. So I want to change that or I want to do something different or I want to make sure that things are changed. But because of what they've been through and often it could be redundancy, it could be bullying, it could be someone restructuring their company, it could be just they've had enough. They've left corporate life and suddenly they don't have that as an identity. And so you do feel like an imposter because you're like, well, I, I don't know where my identity is. And yet at the same time, they're often incredibly fierce and determined and that comes across, but they don't want to be seen as unprofessional either. So there's this whole conflict of, I don't want to be seen for what I'm not, 
I don't want to be corporate anymore, but I can't be seen not to be taking it seriously. And so therefore this whole imposter conflict almost comes out. It's amazing. It's, it really is fascinating. But when I look back, I was like, oh, well, that's why they always struggle with it. That's why they didn't like seeing themselves in photographs because they didn't like that identity that they had. Mm. So it's really about, about creating the image of something they actually do identify with and they want to be identified as. I think that's the other difference. So much of our work life is image-based. You see stuff on LinkedIn, you see stuff on the website, um, and you don't realize it until it's not there. You don't have that to rely on. So you need to create something of your own. Where do we go from this? Imposter syndrome. Yeah, it? it makes sense. It's like, <laughs> there we go. We'll, 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 end up, we'll end up talking about something completely random. If we don't. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose with the imposter syndrome, it's like, it's like when I was, I created my business and actually having the branding once I saw my logo, saw my branding, it felt more real. And it's not until like, for example, when I started creating videos and then seeing myself on video with the branding and my title and you think, okay, I start feeling more part of your identity. So, and, and they find it in people with imposter syndrome and normally the more um, like creative, high performing people who, because they're always battling with this imposter syndrome of feeling like a fraud, they end up doing so much more to try almost to prove to themselves they are worth it or they are that person and there's also an element of when is someone going to find me out that yeah. i'm 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 just winging it <laughs> and what you then realize what's interesting is you get to a point where you realize that a everybody's winging it b it's actually not about you the branding and how you look it's not about you at all it's about showing you to attract the right people to your business. And that takes quite a long time, uh, quite a lot of process, I think, as well, because that whole, I don't wanna be seen, but I need to be seen. And I need to grow a business, but I, I'm not sure how to grow a business, so. Um, yeah, but I, I really, really want to do it. So you make yourself yeah. really vulnerable, don't you, by putting yourself out there, and that is scary. <laughs> then you open yourself up to loads of rejection, and which feels personal because it's your own business as well. Yeah, that's a huge thing. Yeah, and I think the what I've now realised is it's far easier to focus on growing your tribe mm -hmm. around you because that that not only does it take it away from you but it helps you define who you work best with. So rather than making it about, oh, I need to be up in the stars and you know, standing out, actually, it doesn't matter if someone doesn't like what you do because they're not your ideal client. Yeah. But that, again, takes a long time for you to recognize it's nothing personal. Yeah. It's really not. Yeah. Um, and I think what's interesting is when I do photo shoots with people and we talk about this and I ask them, you know, who's their ideal client? Because for me, once you verbalize it, I can then also include it in when I talk about you and social media stuff. And for me, that's quite important because I love promoting what people do yeah. because everybody does some really interesting, different things. And if I understand it, then I can then bring that out mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And imposter syndrome and everything that will come into so much of what you do and that's how like you really focus on bringing that out of, of people and allowing them to see themselves in a way that poten potentially like you said they've avoided that sense of identity until then yeah so how are you how are you dealing with covid so obviously you you we were talking about how mental health first aid is so important in fact that we've got to kind of protect ourselves as well and we were saying the other day that it's because we t absorb so much emotion, it doesn't matter how many tools and techniques that we've learned. So we've done so much training on self-development as well. So much stuff, we've done so much work on ourselves. It doesn't matter how much work you've done sometimes, you still get battered with a stick. And you know that's okay to feel like that. 
So I was kind of digging into that and digging into like kind of how are you coping with this COVID world? So right at the beginning of lockdown, do you remember I did a speech about how this is my second lockdown? Yeah. And that um, I've been in this position before. And actually the hardest thing is recognizing that you just have to let things go. Sometimes you can't keep pushing, you can't keep working, you can't keep trying to do everything that you've done previously. I think one of the real traps was, I think I went in, I've done this before, I can do this. Yeah, totally, this is okay. But my business completely gone overnight. I couldn't photograph people, um, no conferences. The first two weeks of lockdown, I was meant to be in Spain and then I was meant to be in Greece. So. You know, my life completely, well, what I thought was my life. So the way that I coped with it really is I pivoted my business to do something different. So it gave me a different focus, but it also made me recognize how difficult it must be for other people who aren't that entrepreneurial and don't see possibilities or opportunities when we're in a shit situation um, and I've always been this annoying Pollyanna type where whenever something terrible happens my first instant reaction is well it could be worse <laughs> and that's good in the immediate not great in the long term because you then don't want to deal with the fallout yeah and the negative side of coping with all of it how I have coped with mm. lots of plants. <laughs> oh my god, I'm turning to the crazy plant lady. <laughs> okay. Well, hmm. So I used to not be able to keep orchids alive. Everybody gave me freaking orchids. I'm like, why do you keep giving me these stupid tropical plants? We live in a cold climate. Don't give me those. I can't keep them alive. And so I literally thought I couldn't do with plants. Turns out I'm quite good at the green ones. <laughs> yeah. So that used to be just a few leaves. That's just, you know, cascaded. That used to be that high. So that, that's three months worth of tree growing. There are 10 other plants up on the ceiling. Yeah. And I think what's interesting about the plant things, so it's big on Instagram as well, is because we've had to be indoors and you're initially only allowed out for one hour a day i think having green stuff in the house made you feel much more um reassured almost i don't i don't understand but the green just makes you feel more alive as opposed to all the stuff that you have in the house yeah do you know do you know the little bit of science behind that okay tell me is it a little, little bit no doubt <laughs> okay, okay go on so there's this thing called fractals and they're basically repeated patterns and they're really, really common throughout nature, like abundant throughout nature. And yeah. so plants have them, trees, all that stuff. And our eyes love fractals. So every time uh. we see things and they help, they help to reduce stress. So it kind of like gives us all our nice happy hormones. And just by looking at nature, it reduces your stress hormone by like about 60%. I wonder, so there is this theory, particularly around Instagram pictures, about the evenness of photos. And I was reading about this and that, and I'm wondering if it's this, what it is, the fractals of some of the most liked pictures are because they are so uniform. Mm. Beautiful, but uniform. And I think we must find something reassuring in seeing nature, the chaos of nature, organized. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no straight lines in nature. Have you ever noticed that? There's no perfect straight lines. Only only man makes straight lines, or women. <laughs> <should I? laughs> but um, in nature is like it might look straight, but it's it's all wonky. Wonky. Yeah. Hmm. Mm, How have you coped in lockdown? <laughs> huh? What? 
I said, Am I allowed to ask questions? You? <laughs> You're reverting it. Okay. I've coped all right. I've coped. Well, you know, you know, me, I went away on holiday um, <laughs> two weeks before lockdown, left because I've been building up my business for years, left my work thinking, this is it. I'm ready. Let's do this. Two weeks before lockdown, went on holiday and then um, came back to a whole different world. And just like you, suddenly all these plans I had for my business, all these courses I had booked, all these clients I had ready, just everything just went up in flames. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's nice because like you, those opportunities aren't going to go away because people always need what you do. And even if, you know, something that you, you know, a client that you had has been delayed, it's not gone. It's just on the burner. Mm -hmm. But at the time it can feel really, really overwhelming, can it? And I've done the same as you. I've surrounded myself with plants everywhere. And I yep. <laughs> we're addicted, aren't we? And um, I, I think as you, I walked everything. I tried to, I did my yoga every day. Um, it's, it was, I, I've definitely been up and down on this COVID roller coaster though. And just like you said, like no matter how many times we kind of have learned this stuff. Mm. And, you know, like last week, I, mean, I, th I don't know how you're finding this, but uh, re-emerging I knew was always going to be the bigger challenge because last time the bigger challenge was not being at home for months on end it was the oh my god where's my life gone and having to rebuild something from nothing and what I'm finding is I'm going out to do photo shoots yay amazing like it's so much fun doing lots of stuff on the computer that's fine but I will get to Thursday and I will fall over. Yeah. And it's, it's too much mm -hmm. because like I stupidly went shopping one day. That was a bad idea. Not doing that again. Um, and then did a photo shoot and then had a whole bunch of meetings the next day. And I'm, I don't quite understand whether it's because the COVID fear is overloading us already. Then you go outside and then you're dealing with people a lot and you're trying to be sensible but also trying to keep it normal um, and mindful that some people are still very very afraid and some people are like whatever um, and that's quite scary as well because then you don't know where you fit on the spectrum yeah. and are you going to offend someone by being too laissez-faire or are you judging them because they're being so paranoid? Mm -hmm. And that, that is such hard work on our brains because it's no longer just about what we'd normally judge in society before. And that was quite automatic. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think that's what it is? No, I, I completely agree. If you think of it in, do you remember the stress container in my yeah. doctor's aid? Like there, every I like says about how everyone has a stress container, and then your stress fills up, and then if you don't have good coping mechanisms, it overflows. Um, yeah. If if like you're saying, we've already got so much going on in our heads already, just managing this chaos, that our stress container is already like up here, just the yeah. day to day life. Yeah. And then you then have to, like you said, go to a shop, and where you used to just think right, what do I need to buy, and just navigate the store. Now you have to navigate people. And like I said, there's some people that don't care, that walk basically straight into you as if COVID's never happened, which is infuriating and a little bit scary. And then you yeah. have some people who are so paranoid that you kind of, they, they move away from you. And yeah. then so you have that in your head, even though you respect it and you've got your mask on, it's also that social rejection. Yeah. And, and that that's really hard to boggle with <laughs> and particularly when you then can't smile away you know how when and you're the same as me you'd be like oh that's fine no more i understand but they can't freaking see your smile and, I like, <laughs> and so i'm like am i like overcompensating with my eyes do i want a sign that says it's all okay maybe that's what I'm not both. <laughs> yeah it is it is too much like i i went like when I see people at the moment, it drains me. Like it absolutely yeah. drains me. And it's because I'm not used to that as well. But also I found quite interesting is when I actually, when lockdown came into play and suddenly I was only seeing Paul every day, um, I just realized how 
much different people due to my energy. Some people will really like vibe me up, get me going. And then some people drain me. And it's not until I've separated completely from society that I was able to notice that. And you know, what's really interesting. I was thinking about this yesterday, actually, like, how do I only choose to spend time with people that don't drain me? Because like you collected loads of people. It's not that they offend me. It's that you don't help me. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time with you. And then that gets really hard because you think, how do you explain to someone you're a drain, not a radiator for me. And you know, you might be a radiator for someone else, but not for me. Yeah. And that is a really interesting minefield. And I was just thinking of the mask thing as well, that, we rely so much socially on our expressions yeah. to read what other people are feeling or what they're actually reacting to. But if you've got a mask on, I mean, you know, you can't see anything. Mm. It's all gone. Yeah. And it's the smile, it's the facial expression that tells us, like we say, whether they're friend or foe. Like yeah. it tells us whether we're the safe company or not. Yep. Yep. It is. It's... Yeah. And I think that stress levels, you're quite right. You know, now, now that, yeah, you kind of, you know, we already are at 80, 85, 90% capacity. So no wonder just going out and doing a simple, a simple thing like food shopping put me on the couch for a day. Mm -hmm. literally, my best friend was like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, you haven't been to a supermarket yet, have you? <laughs> and she's like, no. I'm like, because they've done online deliveries the whole time but I said I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to take the space of someone else who really needs it I can perfectly capable of walking around a supermarket and getting my own food whereas other people have had to shield and I haven't had to so I'm taking a different mental toll so that they're protected but that's not how everybody sees it so yeah interesting what other coping mechanisms so loads of people have done baking I don't have an oven that works. Which is probably a blessing in disguise. What? <laughs> I don't have any baking skills, so between us, we'd be screwed. I'm a good baker, just no oven. Um, mm. But I think that's what's interesting is that everybody's sort of focused on creating something new. Yeah. So we rely so much on facial um, communication for, what is it? Is it seven? 50%? Oh, it's like 65%, like it's high of nonverbal communication. 738, I can't do the maths. Yeah, 65, 35. Or so. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Um, we rely on, you know, facial recognition and nonverbal communication. But when we're on Zoom all the time, you and I are very, very well lit. But how many conversations have you had with people on their laptops or on their computers and you can't even see their faces? Yeah. And that to me is social death because that's, that's as good as wearing a mask and not being able to see them because you can't read the other 65% of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess that's why photos are so important because you can see all of that. But yeah, no, I just created a whole new business. <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah, just tell us about that. So no we, we went, well, we knew each other through Toastmasters, didn't we? Which is a, for those who don't know Toastmasters, it's a public speaking group where you kind of just learn to get over your terror around public speaking. And we... And by the way, just a second. Yes. So both Becca and I are presidents of clubs this year. So it's quite a special year for us. We are. Yeah. Women are taking over. <laughs> no, no, no. We're just, we're just equaling out the, the playing field. Yes, yeah, you're right. We're not taking over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yes we are we're both present so um what what i find fascinating is like you said how you've pivoted and mm. you've made your business around all this virtual world we see see like we're dealing with now mm. and with what we've had to do in toastmasters we've now taken this public speaking group online mm. and we're trying to learn how to navigate this whole virtual speaking like like you said body language like what we used to be able to see on stage with people and go this is how you communicate now we're having to 
completely mm. and, so, and the reading of the audience i mean i don't know about you but the first couple of weeks it was terrifying because we had everybody on mute and i'm i can't remember whether i gave one the first week or the second week or something but everybody was muted so it was like i was speaking into a void and i'd spent so long and i know you're the same really going into listening to the vibe of the audience because that's quite an important thing as a speaker that you respect how people are feeling and responding to what you're saying and there was nothing and you're just like Mackenzie am I speaking good enough what am I doing <laughs> and now obviously we don't have everybody on mute all the time so you do get feedback but I think right at the beginning you couldn't have two people speaking at once. So even if like you and I could just were talking before over each other, oops, but you suddenly had to respect what the other person was saying and wait till they got to the end of the sentence so you could then interject. But in person, you wouldn't have to do that. Yeah, it's more natural flow, isn't it, in person? What I'm finding curious is that I think well, I'm hoping when we do have more face-to-face -face meetings, people are going to be more aware of waiting for someone to finish their sentence mm. and respecting the fact that lots of people, like you and I don't mind being interrupted, but there are lots of people who actually would be super offended if they weren't allowed to finish their point. And they wouldn't feel confident enough to re-emphasize it or bring it up again later. They would just leave the conversation. Have you heard about Zoombies? They're calling everyone zombies now, like the oh, Zoom okay. version of zombies. Because we've got so much Zoom fatigue that we're just drained from all this. And a part, a part of it as well, which I think um, you're quite um, good at doing now as well, is, is hiding your self view. Because for uh, when we first started using Zoom, seeing my face was so distracting. Mm -hmm. like, you can't help but take a look at your own face then. Not because yeah. you're vain, not because you want to see what, like, it's just your faces, will, eyes will be attracted to your own face. And that is tiring to look at yourself all day. It really is. Yeah. It really is. And then, and I'm still doing it. I'm like, oh my God, stop looking at yourself. <laughs> but <laughs> there is also a huge element of judging ourselves, which we've never done before. Wow. So we've always assumed that we are what we are. And it was only when I started to do Toastmasters and I videoed myself to practice mm. that I saw that I had a really weird facial tick. What is it? No one, no one in my entire life had ever pointed this out. What is it? It's gone. I've got rid of it, dude. Come on. <laughs> what was it? It was some weird, like, thing with my lip. <laughs> I used to know. <laughs> I was just like, what is that? No one said anything about that. That must look really weird. <sighs> but I mean, that's the thing. I spent quite a lot of time practicing in front of the camera. And anybody who's, you know, in filming or in acting or anything like that, they're now used to seeing themselves on camera. But most normal people. Yeah. You know, their marketing person will tell them, get on and get behind the camera, do some videos, put some stuff up on social media. And they don't because they don't want to see themselves on camera. And this actually is very common, a common thing for people not wanting to do photographs. The first thing that they will tell me, they're not photogenic, they'll break the camera, that <laughs> they don't photograph well. And I'll be like, yeah okay how about you just leave that to me because what actually happens is that when you do see yourself on the screen and you've done it correctly you look like you do normally but what happened when we all went on zoom and you know i was guilty of it myself the first week or so i didn't have the right lighting so i was brown you couldn't see me like you just couldn't see me and I had the this camera with the light behind me so it was backlit worst thing possible so what I then realized was that I could correct it quite easily because I've got studio lights 
Actually, do you know the irony of all of this? My studio light was not actually for the photo shoots. It was because I lived in a horrible dark cottage and I had to buy the cheapest LED light possible. So that's, that's what it is. It's not, it's not, but well, it is a photographic light, but yeah. But not many people started lockdown with an LED. No, with a studio. <laughs> <laughs> and apart from the else, I mean, the, the flashlights wouldn't work anyway. But yeah, so I then realized so many people were going to struggle being on Zoom because they were trying to figure out what the other person was saying visually. And if you can correct that, which is quite easy to correct for lots of people, then it'll make you less like a Zoombie and more just like you. But what's interesting is that it's the women who care about that the most mm. because they're the ones that rely so much more on the visual cues and they recognize very early on that's what was going to go missing you work with people don't you now to fix lighting and so yeah. you kind of switch you've uh, you've pivoted you still you know you still do your photography outdoors and everything while we're kind of more in lockdown you pivoted as well to kind of create a nice background for other people and help them see themselves better mm. well yeah i mean it's creating the image that you see in the mirror mm. because what happens is the camera computers are absolutely rubbish you know you can do all sorts of things to the camera um, on your computer to help you as opposed to hinder you so things like let's see there's, there's all sorts of tricks so like tricks to trick the camera. So see how the, my face is completely different. I just put my hand over the camera. Yeah. So there's a bunch of things like different lighting. Um, and when we first went to lockdown, I didn't want people ordering loads of stuff from Amazon because A, it would take ages to get there. And B, we didn't know how long we were in lockdown for. We were told it was three weeks. Huh. I don't think anybody really thought that, but, <laughs> but, you know, I didn't want people ordering loads of stuff that maybe they wouldn't need in three weeks time. So, and it was fascinating, you know, send up email, get all the lights you have in your house, all of them. And it's fascinating what people had or didn't have. Um, and just, yeah, lots of different things that worked and what didn't work. So one guy, he was on two screens, so I've got two screens. Um, and halfway through, one of his monitors went off. And the whole picture changed. And I was like, dude, you need to leave your monitor on. That's all he needed. Like, it sounds so simplistic. Another layer of light. Hmm. He, all he had to do, well, he had a few other things. He had to put an orange um, picture, picture just orange card, over the screen. And that made him look super healthy. Wow, nice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so what's, give, one, what's one tip, the easiest thing that someone could do without giving away everything, just like one thing that they could do to make, it, make things better? Um, so I think the biggest tip is that if you can see the colour of someone's eyes, you've got the lighting right. Wow. So what colour are my eyes? Green. Very nice. Yeah. What colour are mine? Brown. <laughs> <laughs> but you're also quite far away, so I couldn't quite it's see. It's true. It's true. And I also know you've got brown eyes. But yeah. that's the thing. If you're meeting someone for the first time virtually and you can't see the colour of their eyes, it means that means you're actually missing a lot of the information from their face. Yeah. And it sounds a really simplistic thing, but you try. Put, put lots of different lights up and just see what you can see. Because if you can't see the eye colour, the, the camera hasn't got enough to work with. So that's the difference. I like that. That's because um, the cameras are so rubbish that unless you give it enough information, it can't reset the lighting. So if I go back here, that's about as far back as I can go. And that plant looks enormous in comparison to me. No, it's it double your size, Mel. <laughs> um, but you now can't see most of my expression. 
because I'm so far away. You can see that I look pretty healthy, but the closer you are, the more the camera has to work with. So if you fill a third or two thirds of the screen, that's what the camera focuses on. Whereas from back here, it was focusing on the white. Yeah, yeah. Um, you kind of mold into your plants then, don't you? Mm, yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah, so that's my tip. Find your eye color and then you know you lit properly. I like that. Yeah, there's all sorts of things that you can use. But I think that's the other thing because mm. I know where to put the lights mm. to, make, to make that work. Yeah. Oh, I swear, the best one that I did was this girl had a, um, one of those sad lamps. Oh yeah. But not like a little sad lamp. It's like, what's that? Like, oh. So I was like, oh, that's amazing. So she has it on a shelf behind her iMac. So not only does it light her up, like, and this is the best thing ever. And I swear if I could get everyone to get one of these lamps it would just fix a lot of problems, particularly mental health problems. It was also giving her the sunshine light from those boxes that she needed to feel better about herself. You know, the whole sad thing when we first started, I mean, when March? March, yeah. Yeah, March. So we were still in the, in the window when people still rely on light boxes quite a lot. Uh, controversial or not, it's now pretty accepted that we are going to have a second wave at some point. Whether we do or not, who knows? But if that does come September, October, yeah. we're going to be indoors at a time when there is very, very little sunshine. We all need sad lamps by that point. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I'm thinking actually. The that, sad for those who don't know is seasonal affective disorder. Yeah, so it's time oh. where if there's like reduced sunlight, they're not getting enough vitamin D, and um, people get really affected emotionally a lot they feel really down they don't have no energy it's a it's quite a, it's a difficult time for people who are affected by sad yeah so i first got it when i my first winter in the uk and i actually had it in australia but because it's so it i mean back then it was so unheard of that i didn't know what it was and we put it down to the fact that i'd been on a lot of steroids that winter for um chest infections like literally that's what we assumed it was it wasn't until i got it again here that i went that's not that wasn't that okay so ended up at the gp lots of tears going what is wrong with me i'm normally positive i'm normally upbeat i don't understand and she's like i know what this is okay great um and I think anybody who's had it or who gets it or however you want to describe it, you're suddenly way more mindful for recognizing that you're capable of experiencing those emotions um, and more aware that other people might be the same. So I've got, there's a, a little gang of four of us and we all get it, but we all get it at different points in the winter. Mm -hmm. So some people, it'll be right at the beginning when, you know, things get dark. Whereas I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. Fires, stay indoors, have hot chocolate. Yay. I get, <laughs> I get it in February when I have had enough. <laughs> I just can't handle it anymore. And it's been raining for weeks on end. And it's that horrible, can't get out, but I have to get out and yeah everything just gets awful and the other and the reason it kind of works is because the others have it at different times so it's all kind of staggered mm. so one of them always gets it at christmas time she really just yeah can't mm. can't cope with christmas at all whereas i'm like oh my god christmas awesome <laughs> <You know? laughs> it does take me to february to be like I can't deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> Turn from Tigger to Eeyore. Oh, God. 
And yeah, that's a very good description actually, because I used to get called Tigger a lot. So yeah, good to Eeyore. But I do wonder about the second wave. It is something that we do have to be like mental health wise, I think be much more conscious of if we are going to go into second lockdown because in um, my home city, Melbourne has gone back into lockdown. Um, and I'm trying to organize to talk to my whole family because they've all been locked down. Um, and I think it would be devastating because we're suddenly trying to convince ourselves to go outside, go and do things normally face to face. And then you get told, no, stay indoors for another six weeks. I think anybody with kids, I mean, it would just, I mean, it's not that they have it worse, but and they've got summer holidays now. There is no school to keep them entertained for the next six weeks. If we got told we had to go into lockdown tomorrow, can you imagine what would happen? Yeah. A lot of seriously un overwhelmed people. Well, that's why it's so important, I suppose, to set, make sure you set up your home now. So whether we do go into lockdown or not, I think something that I would say is to create a safety plan for yourself now. Have coping mechanisms. One, know what they are. So say, for example, we go into lockdown and you're like, right, okay, what helped me last time? Going out walking. Maybe you can't walk as much because it's, it's maybe crappy weather when it's, it's winter. What else can you do? Getting outdoors, even for five minutes, can help. And like how Get more plants. yeah exactly surround yourself with plants. <laughs> like do things like if you're like like mel was saying people being creative with baking you know have this kind of safety plan around you so that whatever happens because we were never able to we'd not experienced that before we didn't have anything set up so at least we have that now we have that experience we just need to adapt it to the new winter world potentially if it happens later on Hmm. I mean, I'm hoping it doesn't happen, but I think that it is a real opportunity for people to really change how they're working. If we're using Zoom much more effectively, not just in place of everything else, but if we're using it effectively, we won't turn into Zoombies and it'll be a tool rather than a, a hindrance. Yeah. And you're right in having a safety plan is a great idea because now we do have a window of opportunity to prepare if we need to. I mean, the thing is, was it America or was it here? One of, either one of us, no, it was America. They dismantled their um, infectious diseases response plan. One of the first things that Trump did, that's why I remember, he shut down the um, strategic planning for if there was a pandemic. Why? Because it was the first thing Obama did when he got into office. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. So it's like, chop that off. Um, and you think, what, well, you know, would their response have been a whole lot different if they hadn't chopped that off? So now we have, you know, July, yeah. August, prepare a bit better. Mm, yeah, I reckon we can yeah. use it to our favour, can't we? Yeah, I mean, I think it's contingency planning. Yes. Because yeah. we don't want it to happen. But if it does, isn't it better that we're in a better position than like you arriving back from Thailand in a panic with no food and you know, nothing to get to? I mean, geez. The, you know, I just had this image of you rushing through three airports trying to get home. <laughs> and I'm like, and there's no food at home. They left with no food because why would you leave food at home? Because you were going to go for a month, yeah. so you wouldn't. Well, that's a, that's the thing. We uh, we heard there's we heard there was no toilet roll, and we were like, oh my god, we didn't stock up a toilet roll. Like, why would we? <laughs> and then, but bless her poor sister, she is an absolute legend. She came round like literally about a day before we arrived back, and they they lay, like made a little like um, a DIY Livy thing. What do we call it? A, like a thing to let the food down. They made just like this rope thing put it down over our back fence and so that when we got home we had a whole bag of food we had like hand sanitizer in there we had toilet <laughs> roll we had like like oh, pasta everything like oh she was an absolute saver she was yeah. so but yeah. yeah you're right so on that line so i know we've come into we've been talking for quite a while <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll go with number one. Bringing it to a kind of nice kind of close of closure from that point. Mm. What is one thing? So every, you know, everything I do in my business is about giving people the control back on like kind of empowering people to be like, you totally have so much control over your own life and how you kind of build your well-being and how you support your emotional health. And so what is one thing people can do today or in the relative future that can improve their sense of well-being? Get more plants. <laughs> yes. Yes. In all seriousness, I think it is crucial that you care about something else outside yourself. Yeah. I'm on my own, but I have Mackenzie. And I think anybody who's got family around them, they've got something else outside them. So that that is something else. But caring about something else outside yourself day to day certainly gives you a focus. And I think something more tangible to come out of being locked up all this time. Um, yeah, I love yeah. that. I love it's that. Look after yourself, but <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It, it's very easy for us to get quite insular, I think, in this whole situation. And also comparing our own situation, our own journeys to other people's. So, yeah, that's the one thing I would say. I'd agree with that like my um I've like the amount of plants that I've kind of gotten watched grow over the last four months and I do I get I sometimes I go I go to Paul I love plants and he's like okay <laughs> <laughs> do you love plants or are you just saying you love plants because you can see them and but I literally am just like because I watch them grow and then you watch, like, you watch them from this tiny little bit of flower and it's just oh god I can't even I can't even, I can't imagine what I'd be like with children if I'm like that with a plant <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think you're right it is because there's so much we were talking about the overload of the stress and um so much of it is about protecting ourselves that if you don't have something outside that and with so many people being made redundant now or um being on furlough or you know, now facing going back to work and how does that work? Yeah. yeah. If you, you were so afraid of all of that, you still need something else to look after outside that. I really like that one. Mm. Very nice. Thank so you. if everyone has fallen in love with you during this podcast, where could they find you? Well, I have a website. Uh, so if you Google Vivacious Mel Photography, you'll find it. You'll find me on LinkedIn, Mel Cunningham. Um, Instagram, Vivacious Mel Photography. I'm not brilliant on Facebook. <laughs> Better to get me on LinkedIn or Instagram. <laughs> Lots of posts on there. I will link to them all in the bio below. Thank you ever so much, Mel. I've loved it. It's been fun as always. So subscribe if you want more videos. I hope you enjoyed it. Reach out to Mel. Say thank you. Say hi. And oh, before I go, we have to do my Maui habit. What's up? So at the end of every podcast, I always do the Maui habit where I get everyone to kind of just relax, breathe, and I end with a really nice kind of motivational thing. Okay, so... Close your eyes and repeat after me when I say it. So close your eyes, roll your shoulders back. Take a deep breath. And say, today is going to be a great day. Today is going to be a great day. Love it. Lots of, uh, today is a <laughs> that. I loved it. <laughs> so dramatic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mel. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you. <laughs>